udah Oke, okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to visiting lecture today with University Malaysia Perlis. Welcome to the Honorable Dr. Sarmini Abdullah as a research fellow Center of Excellence for Social Innovation and Sustainability. As for the topic today is business communication. Today's session is being live stream on Universitas Tecom YouTube channel. And for today even, we will first... Session is class presentation by Dr. Sarmini. Continue with Q&A session. Time for picture and closing. So we will start for this class today right now. For Dr. Sarmini, you can start the session today. Thank you. All right. Assalamualaikum. And thank you very much, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Chairperson. So, uh, so without uh, wasting any more time, I will dive into our presentation today, which is uh, the topic of our lecture is business communication. Go you. It's, uh, can everyone hear me? All clear? Eh, eh. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'll good. add a slide first. Okay. Just give me a moment. All right, can you all see the slides? Is it clear? Yes, very clear. clear. Okay. All right, as how I have been introduced by the Miss uh, Chairperson, I'm Dr. Sharmini Abdullah from the Department of Language and General Studies from the Faculty of Business and Communication, University of Malaysia Police, and I'm also one of the research fellow for our Center of Excellence for Social Innovation and Sustainability, University of Malaysia Police. So this afternoon, I'll be giving a small or a short lecture on business communication. Okay, uh, please let me know if uh, you can't hear me clearly or if there's any technical interruptions, okay? Otherwise, I will proceed slide by slide, okay? So what I'll be lecturing on today will be on this following subsections or subtopics. So firstly, we will be, I'll be lecturing or explaining or describing on why effective communication matters in business settings. And then we'll proceed to key elements of effective communication. And then we'll proceed to choosing the right communication channel and then adapting communication style for business success. The fifth subtopic will be overcoming barriers to communication in business. And before I conclude, we will be uh, going through on a subsection where we'll be looking into effective communication in the business environment. And then there'll be a short conclusion and, and I'll end the presentation, okay? Everyone can hear me clearly, yeah? All right, I'll go on to the next slide. Okay, what is business communication? Okay, it's the exchange of information within a business environment to achieve specific objective. Okay, such as maybe you communicate to convey ideas. We communicate with one another or it can be with one person or with an individual or with a group. On the following objectives, you convey ideas, you share information, you make decisions, and you build relationships, okay? So business communication is mainly you communicate to achieve certain targets or objectives that is pertaining to the um, business uh, targets, lah, all right? All right, what is communication? Communication is one of the major concerns in the workplace. I think nothing operates without us communicating, whether it is verbal, non-verbal, or in written form. So we communicate virtually 24 hours every day. The moment we open our eyes and until we close our eyes, we're actually Conducting some form of communication. If it's verbal, then you see us speaking. If it's non-verbal, it's either through body language, through facial expression, or written where it's very normal in our workplace where we communicate through what reports, 
all right, through email, through WhatsApp, messaging, and so on. Okay, so that is why creating and maintaining a positive work environment is what effective workplace communication means. Okay, and how do we do it? Let's find out. All right, why effective communication matters in the business setting? Okay. Communication is the lifeblood of any successful business operation. Effective communication leads to four major, I would say, uh, areas, lah, all right, or achieves for these four main uh, objectives, okay? When a communication is effective, it facilitates smooth operation of business processes, whether it can be trading, it can be buying, it can be selling, it can be convincing uh, clients and so on, okay? It enhances or increases the productivity and efficiency of an organization, all right? It strengthens relationships with stakeholders, meaning employers, clients, and partners. And it minimizes or reduces conflicts and misunderstanding. That is why it is very important that we know how to communicate, not only communicate, but Communicate effectively, all right? A successful business means you're, you're incorporating effective communication, okay? All right, actually, I want to ask all of you, when it comes to effective communication, what does it mean to you? Okay, so I'm going to... We share Give me one minute. Can you see this? Can you see the screen? I want you to answer. Let me present it. Actually, I'm supposed to share your, your uh, what? Your scan first, sorry. Yes, miss. Okay, wait, let me turn it on. Well, you're supposed to scan. Okay, can you all see your join menti.com? Use the code. Actually, I can share your wait. Let me share you all the, the QR code. It's better. Okay. It's fixed time. Okay. okay, can you all scan? You all scan the QR code, it's easier. Once you have done scanning, can you let me know? So I'll project the page where the responses will come up. Can all of you scan? Any problems with... Uh, with the QR code? Any problems? Can you all join? And can you answer when it comes to effective communication? What does it mean to you?
Any problems? Let's see some chat here. Let me see. Oh, the code. Okay. Uh, I shared the QR code, but don't have it. Let me type the code for you. Three, two. It's on the screen, actually. Six, two, five, eight. Yeah, thank you. Actually, your scan the code should be easy. Shall I project the page on the code? It's big enough for you to scan or not. All right, some of you actually texted the answer. You can actually type into the Mentimeter. I should see some responses here, actually. Can you hear me now? I think I was muted earlier on. Okay, good. Yes, yes, we can Practice hear it, Miss. Feedback, respect, adaptability. That's interesting. Non verbal communication, feedback, clarity of purpose. Good. Any more? Adaptability is very, very good. Adaptability. And then I think someone shared on the chat also, actually. The chat box. Okay, timing. It's interesting. Practice and feedback. Okay. A communication that deep. Clarity of purpose. Results as desired. Okay, but that's true. You achieved objectives. 
Any more responses? Repeated question. This is interesting. Empathy and understanding. Timing anymore? Anymore? Okay. All right. Okay. May I ask the person who actually uh wrote on adaptability? That's interesting. Can you share what 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 is your view on this? How does adaptability equates to effective communication. Then somebody also mentioned timing. This is interesting. And also having respect. All right. So can you all share what you mean by adaptability? What do you mean by this? How does adaptability actually release or contributes to a, an effective communication? Very silent. So meaning when you adapt yourself to the context of the situation, who you're communicating with, is that what you mean by adaptability? And then having repeated question is actually interesting. All right, because all right, I see a chat answer here. Clearly, your communication sounds to suit the audience and context. Very good. So just your tone, language, and deliver based on cultural norms, individual preferences, and the situation. Yes, very good. Okay. All right. And effective communication also means the ability to convey information clearly, accurately, and appropriately to achieve the desired outcome. So it's not only expressing oneself clearly, but also actively listening to others. Good understanding their perspective and responding thoughtfully. Effective communication encompasses various aspects such as verbal and non-verbal cues, tone of voice, body language and empathy. It's about being able to articulate ideas, thoughts and emotions in a way that foster understanding, builds trust and facilitates productive interactions and relationships. Okay, hey, y'all are yeah, very interesting and near and very accurate uh, definitions. Uh, I mean, it reflects on what all of you understand on what is effective communication. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go back to the slides. All right, that's how most of you actually have shared your views on what you think are effective communication. So effective communication is, all right, communication has to take place Two way, there's no one way, all right. There's one way, then something is wrong. Okay, you don't get your message through because you're only talking to yourself. So for any communication to take place, minimum you need at least one another one person or two, three, and more. So that's why for an effective communication, it is a two-way street. That means there's going and coming. All right, that's not just one-sided. Okay, it's there's always two two channels going going on at the same time, okay? So you need to have a sender, which is normally the speaker, and a receiver, which is normally a listener. And a speaker can be one, or it can be two, but normally it's one main person conveying a certain information to either an, one receiver or more than one, okay? And both have their responsibilities as some of you have mentioned earlier that you need to be an active listener as well. No need the person who should be able to articulate what is needed to be done or communicated, but the person listening as well needs to play a role, meaning that they have to be an active listener, meaning that they have to actually listen and not just hear. Okay, So effective communication means the receiver has understood the message. All right, As you mentioned that the results are achieved now by what was intended initially by the speaker. All right. Otherwise, if 
what is has what has been conveyed is not understood, then it is not effective communication. Okay. Right, and somebody mentioned there are two very key elements in ensuring that an effective communication takes place. Number one, as you have, as some of you actually already stated in the Mentimeter word cloud, you need to have clear and concise message. And the other two is actually actually active listening. Okay, it's not just is listening, it's active listening, meaning that you're responding to what you're listening to. So when you're active listening, means that you understand what was being conveyed. So you can actually respond in accordance to what has been communicated to you as the listener. All right. So in order for any communication to take place, you need to have clear and concise messaging. That means when you are crafting messages or producing messages or communicating messages, it has to be easy to understand and free of ambiguity. Okay, I'm given some examples here. So rather than using bombastic words, sometimes better to use simplified language rather than high-ended language because sometimes your listeners may misunderstand what you're using based because the words may be too high. So stick to simplified language. So for instance, I give an example of okay, using two high language, we aim to optimize synergistic paradigms to facilitate expon exponential growth. Okay, this is normally, I mean, business context, we're talking about the shares and the productivity of the company. So rather than using bombastic words, you just have to simplify it to make your listeners understand. Our goal is to improve what collaboration and achieve significant growth. So instead of saying we intend to leverage our core competencies for maximum strategic advantage, we just simplify it by saying that leveraging our core competencies is using our strength to gain competitive edge. So sometimes it is much more effective to use simplified language where everyone understands. Okay. So like I explained, use plain or simple language to convey complex business concepts. So this is another example. Rather than saying our fiscal strategy is centered around enhancing profitability via optimized revenue streams and cost management, we simplify it by saying we plan to increase profits by improving how we earn and spend money. Rather than looking at revenue and cost, we just say we earn and spend. Okay, rather than fiscal strategy is planning. All right, enhancing profitability, we just say increase profits. Okay, another example, the innovative integration of cutting edge technology will revolutionize our operational efficiency. So rather than using so many bombastic words or wow words, we just say rather than innovative integration of cutting edge technology, we just say by using advanced te technology, revolutionize our operational efficiency, just say we significantly improve our efficiency. So plain and simple language is always better than using complex concepts. Okay. All right. The second one, which some of you have actually mentioned in our word cloud uh, brainstorming earlier on is active listening. What is active listening? Active listening means it's a form of listening which helps to build rapport, forces better understanding and improves the overall quality of communication in both personal and professional relationships. So it's not passive. Passive listening means you just listen, but you may not be giving a response. But that doesn't entail an effective communication. When effective communication to take place is when you listen, what you're being, information has been directed towards you, you must be able to respond to it. It can be verbally, non-verbally, or written. When you provide a response, then communication takes place because it shows that there is some sort of discussion and understanding going around, okay? So how do we, so that is why we need to encourage active listening among team members. I mean, it's a very common concept that when the superior talks or the big boss talks, the rest keeps quiet, right? But that's not actually good effective communication. Effective communication means that whenever a direction is given or information is shared, 
audience or the listener should actually train yourselves to ask or to affirm what is being communicated towards or to you as a listener. Okay? So you can practice attentive listen during client interactions. And active listen doesn't mean having to speak. Sometimes maybe you're not allowed to speak, but you can actually show your response through facial expressions or body language. And even your tone or voice will actually indicate whether, you know, whatever that's being communicated is in agreement or in disagreement. Okay, use positive and confident non-verbal cues in meetings and presentations. Okay, sometimes it's understandable that when it's a very formal meeting, not everyone can actually speak, but you can still be an active listener by what? Using number three and four. So you use body language, you use facial expressions, okay? You use positive and confident non-verbal cues. So what are these? It's actually more to do your, with your facial expressions and your body language. Okay, so what is active listening actually? It's a communication technique where the listener fully concentrates, understands, responds and remembers what the speaker is saying. Okay, it involves giving complete attention to the speaker, focusing on both verbal and non-verbal cues. And you provide feedback to ensure mutual understanding. It means on your part as the listener, you can actually affirm certain uh, ambiguities of the information being shared. All right, you can ask for more clarification. So that is how an effective communication takes place. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Can all of you hear me clearly? Yes, very clearly, Miss. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how do we actually conduct active listening? So you can maintain eye contact, eye contact with the speaker, all right? Okay, so whoever you're talking or having a conversation with, with you must always look straight into the eye. Don't look down, don't look up, don't look elsewhere, okay? So to show that you are actually interested in what they are saying or conveying to you. So and to show agreement, you can actually nod and smile rather than showing a poker face. You know what's a poker face? That means there's no expression. Okay, so in order to indicate that you are actually listening actively, these are the ways that you will actually indicate to the speaker that you are listening and you are concentrating on what is being conveyed. And normally we actually express it via non-verbal, like facial expression, like what is being um, highlighted here. Okay, so you show eye contact, you make sure you nod and you smile to indicate that you agree. Maybe you may shake your head to say you may not agree. Okay, so these are certain uh, what indicators of showing how you're actually responding to the speaker non-verbally. Okay, so this is when you are allowed to communicate so you can paraphrase in order to ensure that what is being shared with you or conveyed to you or directed to you is in the same page as the speaker. So that is very important. We always must ensure that what the speaker is trying to convey to us, okay, is how you have understood it. So how do you show it? You can actually paraphrase or restate what the speaker said to confirm your understanding and show that you are following the conversation. Okay, so an example of some phrases you can say is so, if I understand correctly, you are saying that, or is it is this how we are supposed to do it? And you repeat what was being instructed to you. Okay, in other ways, you can actually ask open-ended questions as well, rather than paraphrasing what the speaker have said, you can ask them what you want to ask in order for you to understand or have a better clarification of what was being communicated. Okay, you can always ask the speaker to elaborate or explain on their thoughts and feelings. So this is another way when you when you have a Q&A, it shows to the speaker that, oh, you are actually very interested in what is being communicated, okay, or in the discussion. All right? So you already looked at four, so you can... So you have paraphrasing, you have been asking open-ended questions, you can nod, you can smile, and you can establish eye contact. 
Okay. So another way to show is also avoiding interruptions. Never interject when the speaker is speaking. Always allow the speaker to finish what he or she wants or has to say. Only then you can actually interject your questions. Yes, to... Why? Why? Huh? All right, so you avoid interruptions. You let the speakers finish their thoughts before responding. Interrupting can disrupt the flow of the conversation and make and may make the speaker feel unheard. Okay, so if you interrupt when the speaker is in the midst of speaking, it shows that you're not actually focusing and it may cause a lot of unpleasant situation. Okay, and you can also validate... Uh, how you feel towards what is being communicated by the speaker through your feelings. You can either show agreement or disagreement. You can acknowledge or validate the speaker's emotion by reflecting back how they might be feeling. For example, oh, it sounds like you're really excited about that opportunity. Okay, so this is how you actually show you're on the same page with the speaker or what the speaker is trying to express to all of you as listeners. Okay, any questions so far? If there's none, I will proceed to the next. So we have looked at uh, six aspects of active listening. There's more. So you can avoid distractions as well. So minimize distractions. That means that, you know, nowadays a lot of you tend to use the phones and also one way to respect the speaker and to show that you are actually you know, and active listeners by, you know, putting away your devices or gadgets and you not know, paying full attention to the conversation at hand. So you give the speaker your full attention. Okay. And you can also use verbal, non-verbal cue was what earlier on I said, eye contact, you nod and you smile. Verbal is you say, oh, I see, go on, tell me more to encourage the speaker to continue sharing. Okay. This is how you actually foster an effective communication. All right, so in short, what are the main components to make up an effective business communication? Okay, we know that you need to have clarity. All right, you need to have active listening. So you need to focus on what you want to say, meaning that you yourself as a speaker must be very clear on what you want to convey. You must focus on what you're saying. That means stick to simple language so that what is communicated will be understood. And you must be able to understand what your audience will interpret based on what you have communicated. Okay, so it's very important to consider what you want to say, what you're saying, and what your audience may interpret based on what you want to say or will say. Okay? All right. Any questions so far? Anything on active listening, on clarity? If there's none, I'll go on to the next section. So we already covered what are the main key elements of effective communication, okay? All right. So now you know what makes an effective uh, communication, meaning that it has verbal and non-verbal elements. Okay, you show you have to have active listening and you must be very clear and concise with what is being communicated. Okay, another way to actually foster effective communication is also choosing the right communication channel. I mean, those days, you go back so many, 20 years back, in order to communicate, you needed to face the person face to face. Only then communication takes place and then the phone came into place, correct? So we talked using the phone. And then now, in today, in 20, our 20 or 21st century, we have so many other ways to actually communicate. And choosing the proper channel is also very important, okay? So when do you decide to have face-to-face -face meetings? When can I have a video conferencing meeting? Or when should I just text? So these are actually very important, um, how to say, you need to consider the context of what is what the communication is about before you can decide 
what communication channel to use. You can't be using emails all the time to communicate something really important. So I'm giving some examples here. So for face-to-face meetings, I mean, now many prefer to have online meetings rather than face-to-face, but sometimes you need to have face-to-face meetings, especially when you are expecting or you are actually having a discussion. You're going to negotiate to get something, a business deal or something. So that's very, very important for you to actually have a face-to-face rather than online. You understand? All right? But for formal communication documentation, you can use email. But for something really urgent, you can't wait for a meeting, then you give a phone call, okay? Or quick updates for urgent matters. And you can also do instant messaging now. Now, I think when you look at WhatsApp or Telegram, you can actually have a group online meeting, right? Where everybody can actually uh, say hello and, you know, uh, so... When you're looking at team uh, discussions, you can use instant messaging or video conferencing. But when it comes to really important discussion and negotiations to get certain, maybe you need a certain project, you need to get a certain, uh, to achieve a certain target, then you need to have a face-to-face meeting. So you need to also consider the different channels where business communication will require you to use. Okay, You can't use as how you like or as how you please. You need to study the the focus or the objective of why a certain meeting or discussion is taking place. And then you need to decide the proper communication channel to use. Only then what you are trying to convey will be received effectively by the uh, listening parties lah, or the listeners. Okay, So part of ensuring that you use simple language, you use... Um, verbal or non-verbal communication to foster active listening, you also need to be able to know what kind of right communication channel to use, all right? During any form of uh, communication, uh, whether it's going to be a meeting, an interview, all right? A normal discussion, all right? So you need to actually also consider the right communication channel, all right? Any questions? It's none. I'll go on to the next slide. Okay, remember early on in our word cloud, some of you mentioned adaptability. Okay, very good. And so, so this is as how it was explained. Okay, it tailors, you have to tailor your communication modes or methods to the recipient's preferences and needs. Okay, meaning that you need to study who are your audience or listeners first. Okay, of course, you need to, you know, when you're planning a meeting or maybe a discussion or a negotiation or a simple, uh, what? Or a simple meeting, introductory meeting, you need to, of course, plan what you want to say, what you're going to say and what you expect the audience to respond. Okay, but you also need to consider the profile of the audience itself. Where the personal background, where's the audience, your your partner or the person you're going to communicate comes from? Whether are there cultural differences from yours? I mean, in business, you're always meeting with people from different countries, different regions, knowing different languages. Sometimes in certain contexts, you will even require a translator to help you communicate effectively because of uh, no generic uh, language is being understood by two parties. So that is why you need to adapt. That is where the point of adaptability comes in. All right. In order to ensure a successful business transaction, all right, you also have to ensure the cultural differences of your clients and partners. And you also have to adjust your communication style based on the specific business context. Different culture have different ways of conducting certain business transactions. Okay, maybe in our Malaysian culture, Indonesian culture, it may not be considered as formal, but maybe because you're corresponding with a partner that comes from a different part of a part of the world, maybe Japan, for instance, what you deem as informal will be deemed as formal in their context. So you need to adapt to their style, not to your style. That's how you attract partners to, to do business with you. That is the whole objective. So that is why the point on adaptability. It's very, very crucial. 
you need to change and modify your style to suit the client and the partners in order to achieve whatever objectives or attainments that you're intending to get from the person or the client that you are communicating with. So you need to study. If there's a need for a translator, then you need to have a translator. There's a need to have certain, certain uh, what elements or uh, aspects that will actually promote uh, the successfulness of the transaction, then you need to adapt. So you need to change your style. You can't expect your client or partners to accommodate your style. Rather, you have to adapt to the differences of your clients and partners in order for a successful business communication. Okay? It's very different from a normal meeting uh, communication where we normally follow the style of the person who's in charge, all right, if it's your boss, your superior, then normally the audience or the listeners will adapt. But in business context, normally, you will actually have to adapt to the orientation of your clients and your partners in order to close a deal or for a successful transaction or a negotiation. Okay, so it's very important, adaptability. Okay, you need to tailor your communication to the recipient's preference and needs. Okay. What kind of examples that you can actually use? Okay, what we mean by tailoring communication to recipients' preferences and needs. Okay, so here I'm looking at cultural references in international interactions. So through emailing. Okay, see, so normally, of course, it's very hard to have face to face because of the distance okay so you either have email communication so when you're actually emailing an international client from a different culture you have to use appropriate greetings and sign-offs that align with their cultural norms so you need to study the profile of your client or partner okay so for instance in japan it's common to begin with dear and end with best regards while in saudi arabia you can use uh, dear, but you have to use their last name, not the first name, and conclude with sincerely. So these are some examples. How do you say these are the small, small things that actually make or break a deal? Okay, sometimes just not presenting a bombastic uh, proposal to actually, um, how to say, attract the client or partner, but rather these small, small, how do you call the small, small touches. That's what that make or breaks the deal. So you understand their culture, you adapt to their culture, you use what they are accustomed to. That makes your client or partner being drawn towards you or want to do business with you. Okay. So this is just an example, even a simple thing as sending an email. You can offend a client if you do, did not or you were not aware of their cultural differences in the way they write. Okay. So this is an example why you need to be very careful in every aspect of conducting any business deal, okay? All right, so one was emailing, right? Second is during a virtual meeting. Of course, email, you don't really, you just, it's more of a written communication, but what if, what happens when you're actually doing an online, like what's happening now? Okay, I'm in Malaysia here and you're in Indonesia there and you're having a, a lecture, okay, a, a conferencing, okay, a video conferencing online. So here sometimes people conduct virtual meetings, which is quite common in the business world. Okay. So you need to be careful of what time zones and schedule the meeting at a time that is convenient for all parties. Sometimes you're a big business company. So you might be actually dealing with countries from north and south, east and west, where the time zones are so different. So what do you do first? You normally prioritize your partner's time. So maybe that if you see the time is so bad that you may have to conduct the meeting at night, but which is fine because if you want to get the deal, then you will actually accommodate to your whoever you're dealing with. Okay, So you make sure that it is morning in their time, not night time. That means you put them first. Don't put, oh, uh, morning here, then you don't care whatever time they are, everybody comes on. No, that's not the way. Okay, In order to actually attract business partners to you, or your clients, you need to actually consider the time zones and schedule the meeting at a time that is convenient. All right. 
So maybe not too early in the morning, not too late in the evening. So these are the things, these are what we call as the small, small touches, all right, in order to actually um, attract or to make the communication successful. So it makes your partners or listeners and audience happy. Oh, you're, you're considering their time rather than your time, okay? So this is uh, one aspect that you need to consider, okay, when you're having virtual meetings, okay, look for the time zones and schedule it at the time where it is suitable to everyone. No need to one side, okay? Right, so there was scheduling a meeting. What about when you're negotiation and you're making decisions? Okay, so you also need to, if your audience or your clients are actually from different parts of the world, so you need to be aware of differing communication styles. For example, in some cultures, negotiations may involve subtle gestures or non-verbal cues, while in others, direct and explicit communication is preferred. So you need to be adaptable to your approach to accommodate these differences. So again, you need to look at your style, your communication style, how, uh, if in agreement, how, how do they show they agree or how do they show they are not happy with what decisions being discussed. So these are all, how to say, you need to study the background first before you actually conduct. Understand? So apart from... Not, not looking at the time schedule, looking at the time zone. You also need to study their style of agreeing, disagreement. You know, so these are a bit of homework that you need to actually do before you actually conduct any form of communication. Okay. And again, the word adaptability comes again. You need to adapt, all right, to your clientele's uh, background, style, negotiation, uh, gestures, cues, and so on, so that you are able to uh, conduct an effective business communication, okay? And then you also have to consider language and terminology. Remember earlier on, I said always stick to simple language. So again, it comes, it's also around the same thing on trying to use language that is understandable by all parties of different cultures and different nations, okay? So when communicating, say you are communicating with non-native English speakers, you have to use clear and simple language. Why? Because it avoids misunderstanding. Do not use slang or idioms or complex technical terms that might not be easily understood, all right? Because sometimes you think the slang here is all right, but another language might mean negative. So that's why you must be very careful with the kind of language or jargon that you're using. Okay, so if you're communicating in language other than English, make sure you use appropriate terms and avoid colloquial expressions. Colloquial expressions are like slangs and idioms and so on. Okay, any questions so far? No, miss. All right, then I'll continue. So we looked at language, we looked at uh, communication, non-verbal cues. Now we look at uh, presentation and materials, okay? So then when you're preparing your documentation for your clients, okay, or your partners, okay, you have to consider visual and cultural aspects of your presentation materials. Use diverse imagery and white images or symbols that may be culturally sensitive or misunderstood. So you looked at how we need to, you know, in adapting your communication style encompasses quite a lot, right? So we are coming to the fifth part. So you need to look at the time zone, okay? You need to look at the kind of channel that you can use, okay? Then when you are considering the meeting, you need to understand their styles of communication, their kind of cues, how, how do they project agreement, disagreement, you need to understand, okay? And then you need to use, stick to simple language so that it's not misunderstood. What you're trying to convey is understood. And then when you're preparing your materials that you're going to present to your clients or to your partners, you have to make sure that you avoid using sensitive image or symbols. So you need to be actually, you have to do a lot of background check first before you embark on a certain negotiation or business uh, discussion. Okay. 
So you see, you have to consider every aspect from non-verbal, verbal and written. Okay. And then after any discussion or negotiations or has taken place, what must you do? You must always follow up. Follow up what was discussed. Okay. Any international business or even local business, any interaction for the matter lab, there's something that needs to be achieved. Okay, you need to follow up. So you can follow up through many channels. I mean, it can be through an email, it can be through WhatsApp, depending on how important the context of the discussion was. Okay, so you can have a follow up to recap the key points discussed and clarify any action items. That means... What was discussed during the meeting, maybe it was already conveyed or understood. I mean, you see that your client or your audience did understand, but you also need to follow up to ensure that what was discussed is taking place. Only then the transaction is successful. Otherwise, if there's no follow-up, then it's not. Okay, because when you do a follow-up, it ensures that all parties are on the same page. Right? That means what you were communicating was understood by the uh, audience or the listeners or your clients and your partners. So this is where you repeat the question that was discussed during the earlier communication. Okay. And then you can ask for feedback to ensure that everyone is actually understood on what they are supposed to be doing. All right. And it also helps to build a stronger working relationship. So every time you have a discussion, negotiation or a small uh, meeting Thing, make sure you follow up. Do not just leave it as it is and wait for the deadline to come. No, but rather follow up so that when the deadline comes, you get what you are expecting from your clients or from your team members and so on. Okay? So when you tailor communication to the recipient's preferences and needs, all right, Consider cultural differences. You can foster effective and respectful international business relationship. So normally when you're actually dealing with partners, with team members, clients from a different country or different culture, it's very important for you to adapt to their cultural differences. Cultural differences can come in a mode of language, mode of communication, and so certain ways of communicating may be different, and even their presentation and written style is also Different. So you need to actually do a background study a bit before you actually embark on any negotiation or meetings with any partner from a different part of the world. Okay. So that is how you actually adapt your communication style to ensure a successful business transaction. Okay, so you can actually um so for any communication, there's always barriers, as I have highlighted earlier on. Okay, you know, there's cultural interferences, okay? All right, sometimes maybe you're dealing with people who may not be from the same background as you are, having different fields, different expertise. So there are a lot of barriers when it comes to communication in business. So one of it is language, as we have highlighted again and again, Okay. So normally, it's where even though you're speaking to people who know the same language as you, you always use plain language. Do not use technical jargon when communicating with, especially with laymen, with non-specialists. I mean, those who are having the same intellect level as you, it is fine to use technical jargon because they will understand. But when you're dealing with staff who are lesser, who may not have the same expertise level as you, then you need to stick to plain language and avoid technical jargon. You have to be patient with non-native English speakers, and they might where you might you may need to repeat again and again on the same uh, issue or the same um, point, so that whatever that you are being said is understood by the listener. Okay, and you need to always be able to offer explanation if needed. Okay, these are what we call as language barriers. That means you need to elaborate, you need to explain, you need to use simple language. Okay, this is one. What's another? Okay, so you have language barriers, you also have emotional barriers.
experience where you show empathy and understanding during difficult discussions with team members or clients. Okay, sometimes, you know, you have, especially when you're doing negotiations, where you need, you know, the team members, or maybe your clients or your partners to agree to what you want them. Or you have a certain instruction for them to do. And you need them to get it done, but then they may not be showing you positive uh, reactions. So how do you actually handle it? So as a speaker, you must be able to show empathy. You must be able to show understanding and you must not, you must be able to control your emotion so you are composed and professional until you achieve the target that you are wanting to achieve. So you need to be soft when the, when the listeners are not. Okay, when they are being harsh, they're being aggressive, and then you need to be, you can be soft. You have to be soft and composed. You can't also, if they speak loud, you speak loud, then, then it's, an, it's not an effective communication. It's a communication breakdown. So you need to show empathy is how some of you have highlighted during our word cloud discussion. Okay, you have to show understanding. You have to explain more so that the audience or the team members or the clients or the partners understand why you ask them to do or why you need them to do a certain thing. All right? Or why you're giving them this task to be done. So in all times, you have to remain composed and professional, even though your, you know, your team members may be negative, may be aggressive, but you, it's very important to remain composed and professional. So avoid communication breakdown because the objective is effective communication. Okay? So you have to overcome language barriers. You have to overcome emotional barriers, which is very, very difficult. Okay? Sometimes we... It's hard to be composed and professional, but it's something that we need to learn. And you will master it through practice and time. Okay? Of course, it's not easy to achieve emotion, to overcome emotional barriers, actually. But with time and as you conduct more and more, uh, how to say, dealings or negotiations or discussions, you will learn how to actually uh, maneuver around this, uh, how to say, partners or team members or clients that may be very difficult to address. Okay, let's go on to the third. All right, you also have noise and distractions. Okay, this is very common, especially when you're doing, uh, sometimes when you're having online or even when you're having face-to-face, -face, depending on where the meeting or the discussion is taking place. So you must always try to choose a, a suitable and quiet environment, especially when the meeting is important. Okay? And then you minimize background noise during virtual interaction. Sometimes it can't be helped, but these are the things that you need to be mindful of because it can cause misunderstanding because maybe at the time you were speaking or explaining or elaborating something, there was some background noise that actually interrupted and that caused uh, what? How to say the audience, the team members or the clients were not able to listen clearly. All right. So that can cause uh, what? Communication breakdown because of the distraction or noise that comes into play during the uh, discussion or communication. Okay. All right. Another thing is also you can actually encourage open and transparent communication among team members and departments. So early on, we look at communication barriers, which were language, emotional, and noise and distraction. Okay. So how, so that is one, I mean, how to overcome it, I've already explained. So now we also look at how you can actually foster effective communication in the business environment. Okay. So you encourage open and transparent communication among team members and departments. What does that mean? Okay, normal Asian context, normally there's not much of two-way communication. It's always an instruction being given and you need to say yes and get it done. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean an effective communication. Okay, so how do you actually encourage open and transparent communication is you allow your team members to actually ask questions, give them time to respond, get feedback on over any instruction that you're given them. Okay. So you can also have discussions with other members from different departments to get their ideas, their concerns and suggestions. Okay. 
So this will actually encourage collaboration. So it's not just one-sided or just focus on a certain group. So that is what it means by open and transparent communication. That means you open it to others, to outside, from other departments to ensure that you have a, a more, how to say, liberal way of communication in order to get certain uh, decisions or certain problems solved or getting certain uh, instructions being or tasks being done so that it is done happily rather than forcefully. Okay, so this is very important to encourage open and transparent communication, meaning you allow your team members or your your you know your underlings to actually um, communicate how they feel towards the task being given, whether they are able to do it or uh, are they having any problems. So this is what we mean by having open and transparent communication. Okay, this will avoid communication breakdown and you get to achieve what you're set to achieve rather than, you know, um, when you don't allow open or transparent communication, sometimes and most of the time, you may not get what you intended to get because you don't allow your team members to actually discuss. Okay. And then you have another way is how you can foster effective communication in the business environments is to promote a culture of constructive feedback to foster continuous improvement. Okay, so inculcate, all right, a practice of giving and receiving constructive feedback. That means whenever you have a certain task or an instruction, okay, or maybe a certain opinion, you must try to allow your team members to also give their feedback. Of course, constructive on what, how did they think it was? Was it good? Was it beneficial? Was it a waste of time? So these are the things that you need to promote. Okay, feedback is essential. All right, like say maybe after a certain task is done. All right, you have followed up and you know everything is done. So after that, you can actually ask how did your team members feel about it? Was it positive? Was it negative? Okay. So this is one way to actually ensure that, you know, effective communication is going on. It's not just one solve. It's not just happening during a negotiation or a meeting. It's constantly going on 24 hours. So this is how you actually maintain the effectiveness of any communication. Okay. Provide feedback in supportive and respectful manner. We help one another to learn and develop professionally. Okay, that means you as a superior must be able to take feedback from your from your team members and vice versa. So, like I say, it must be composed and professional at all times, even though you're going to hear something that is negative. Okay. And then you must also emphasize the importance of clear communication in meeting business objectives and customer needs. Okay, what is a clear communication? It's your core of your business success. Lah. That means whatever project goals, whatever customer re requirements, you know, whatever your customer needs or your partners or your clients, it is communicated across the, your team members involved so that everybody is on the same page and everybody knows what needs to be achieved. All right. So when you have a clear mode of communication, so your team members stay aligned with the set business objectives and it helps them to deliver high quality services or products la. and sometimes it will exceed customers' expectations. That's what you want. That's the goal of any business transaction. All right? So that is why you need to practice uh, what? These three steps on how you can actually foster effective uh, communication in the business. And um, Any questions so far? Uh, we have a question from participant in the Zoom, Miss. Zoom, Already in room chat. Okay. Okay. In today's rapidly involving global business landscape, how can organization effectively navigate the intricacies of cross-cultural communication to ensure seamless collaboration and sustainable growth, particularly considering the nuances of languages, customs, and communication styles and across diverse regions and markets? Okay, for is. All right, like I was mentioning true, today you are actually going across countries. Okay, but how, like I said, you need to do your background check. 
I mean, whatever is it, like I mentioned earlier on in, in the earlier slides, okay, and overcoming barriers and uh, what understanding, you have to understand your client. You know, in the business world, like, like how to say, like marriage, la, if you want to find a partner, right, you make sure you know whatever the person likes, right? So it's very similar to what you're asking here. How do you navigate? Of course, cross-cultural communication, like I say, if you are going to communicate with somebody that do not understand your language, you either stick to simple language or you have to use, uh, now you can use AI as well. I mean, there's a lot of technology that can help to, to foster effective communication. But for me, it's always studying your client first. You need to understand their culture. You need to know their customs. And you need to accommodate to that. And I think in today's world, it's much more easier to Google the information, right? Rather than, I think in 20 years back, it was hard because you don't really know the person. But now you can actually study through films, through documentaries. You know, looking at, uh, even on YouTube, on videos, on how actually uh, business uh, negotiations or meetings are conducted by uh, your targeted uh, uh, clients. Let's say if your clients are from UK or from America or from, you know, uh, Native America, you can actually, you need to do some search, like a background check. Okay, so you need to check to see. So you need to study, you need to do your homework. Uh, there's no such thing as assumption, no. But you all are lucky because today we have technology to aid us to understand the differences of languages and customs and communication styles that, you know, vary across different regions and different uh, countries. So I don't know if I answered your question, but for me, it's, yeah, you need to do some homework. That means you need to study first. And you can actually look up at videos. Even you can look at the company profiles as well to see how they conduct businesses and what are their interests and, you know, what are their goals and, and what do they expect. And you can actually, uh, in fact, if you are, if you're very high, I mean, if you really want a successful transaction, you can interview with some other companies or other individuals who may have done, uh, how to say, um, we have done some sort of transaction with whichever company that you may be having to deal with. So this is how you actually achieve uh, successful uh, communication uh, with whichever partner that you are intending to have uh, uh, dealing with. Uh. So how far is, have I answered your question? Yes, please. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Still no. Otherwise, we can continue or? Yeah, you can continue. Miss. I think I have a few more slides to go. I'm almost finishing. Okay, so actually, I made a small table. Okay. So in order to achieve an effective Communication in the business setting. Okay, business setting is a bit different because you deal with uh, high-end uh, clients, you have partners, you know, you have to fulfill a lot of targets and parts. Okay, compared to normal, you know, discussion where you have with your team members, so, you know, with other non-business contacts. So here, one thing you need to connect with the audience, like what was highlighted by Faiz line. How do you connect to the audience? That means the audience is your potential business partner can be your client, okay? It can be one of the stakeholders, okay? So you need to connect. How do you connect? You have to understand their differences. It can be their cultural differences. Normally, it's cultural differences, like their norm, their practices, what they like, what they do. When you establish that connections, are already winning the race 50%, okay? So you need to do a background check. And you need to also, if you're hardworking, you need to find out from others who may have had dealings with the potential client that you're going to have dealings with. So you need to do a lot of, a bit of homework before you actually come to the negotiation table with the particular partner or client that you're going to have a discussion with or communication with, okay? Stick to simple words, whether or not, whether, I mean, using bombastic words doesn't mean uh, you're going to achieve what you're going to get. Remember, this is a business dealing. You're in a business context. It's not, 
a presentation where you're going to show whether you are you are you're smart or not. No. Business dealings actually you want to achieve something. All right. Maybe you want to get a project, you want to close a deal, you want to neg negotiate prices, or I don't know, selling and buying. So you need to stick to simple language where both parties will understand because at the end of the day, it's the objective that needs to be achieved. Whatever target needs to be achieved. So that is why you need to connect with the audience. Audience means it's your client, all right, can be your partner, can be your team member, can be your employee, all right? And how do you communicate what you need them to do or what you need to achieve is use simple language. And then you can also, and you need to use body language, active listening. Okay, all right. You show agreement through a smile, through eye contact, through gestures, and how you speak. All right, because in certain contexts you can't always use verbal. Sometimes you need to use non-verbal to show agreement or to show disagreement, to show pleasure, displeasure. The fourth one is you need to be culturally sensitive to any of your whoever that you're communicating with, it can be your partner, client, employee, team member. Okay, a colleague. All right, you need, even though it can be from our same culture, okay? All right, you know, like Malaysians and Indonesians, you're Muslims, right? But how we are brought up is different. So you still need to study, you understand? Or you always need to do a bit of homework, a bit of background check, so that what you bring to the negotiation table or discussion table or meeting table will be pleasant. It will not, how to say, uh, it will not uh, offend whoever that you're going to deal with, all right? And you once that is done, when you overcome cultural sensitivity, when you adapt to their differences, the communication will be effective, guaranteed, because you have overcome that barriers, the language, the emotional, the cultural barriers that you that comes together with the individual. And then once any dealings is completed, you need to follow up. That is where we go for checking for understanding to ensure that everyone is on the same page. How do you seek participation by following up? All right. To ensure that everyone is happy to continue with the task to ensure that the task is achieved. Because at the end of the day, for any business transaction is getting that transaction closed or getting the objective achieved or getting the target attained. Okay. So in order to ensure that they understand and are they actually on board with what you're wanting them to do, you have to ask effective questions and you can actually close by summarizing what all that you have actually communicated earlier. Okay, so these are some of the effective communication skills that you need to have in any business transaction or dealings. Okay, any questions here? Can see got some question. All right, okay. So just let me read a few. We have one from Sukanto. Sukanto, sorry. Okay, in an era where the boundary between personal and professional communication is becoming increasingly blurred due to the prevalence of social media and online networking platforms, how can organizations strike a delicate balance between promoting employees' individual expression and safeguarding the company's brand image and reputation in the digital realm? Okay, uh, for Mr. Sukamto, okay. I'm trying to understand your question actually. I think what you're trying to say is what do you mean by promoting employees' individual expression? May I ask for clarification for your questions so that I will try to answer it in accordance to how I think what I understand is that you're trying to say that how can a company actually, you mean, how to say, um, is this what you're trying to say that the company try to fulfill the needs of the employee, the demands of the employees? Because at the end of the day, employees need to actually 
I mean, how do I say? Uh, I mean, in a business world, you need to be a bit uh, brutal. It's not negotiation. I mean, if you... All right. But I have a feeling it's this. I mean, what she's trying to say is that how can an organization strike a delicate balance between promoting employees' individual expression? I don't think any company... I will disagree to this. For any organization, you do need to promote your employees' individual expression because, I mean, employees are supposed to safeguard the company's brand, image, and reputation. So if any employees actually, and I think there must be a boundary on what they can or they cannot express on their social media. So if that's what I'm trying to, if that's what I understand, like, now everyone is, you know, freedom of expression. So for me, in order to safeguard the company's brand and image and reputation, I think the company must have very strict or very clear policies on what can or what an employee can or should not, uh, how to say, share on their social media page, whether it's a personal or a formal page. I mean, like in university, see, I can give examples. All staff are given the freedom to actually... Um, I mean, you can state what you want to say on social media, but you cannot, um, how to say, you cannot be, you cannot mention specific names. You cannot relate to your working. Like, I cannot say bad things about Unimat uh, if I'm dissatisfied. Uh, so that is, so because if we, we make any negative sentiments on the organization they're working with, the staff actually can be reprimanded by the leader. So this is how you, any organization, any organization protects themselves. Like you need to use legal and you need to communicate to the staff what they can or what they can't express on, you know, on social media. I mean, that's what I hope I answered the question actually. Because I feel um, employees should condone to the company, not the other way around. It's the employee who should safeguard the company's brand, not the company trying to safeguard their own brand. The company can safeguard their own brand by having certain policies and rules and regulations and legal so that they can sue anyone or any employee that is actually going against or that will actually jeopardize the company's uh, branding. So employees should be careful what, you know, on how they conduct themselves within the company. It shouldn't be the company's worry because the company is actually protected by legal. So that's how I will answer the question. Okay, I don't know whether I've answered. <laughs> but I think that's why I, I think that's what he's trying to say. Now, of course, today there's a lot of people doing a lot of funny things on social media, you see. They don't express it to their employers, they express it on social media. So but a company can protect themselves through use of legal. That's what we do in our university. I mean, that's how our I mean, my own university here, that's how we protect uh, the uni from students and also from staff who may actually express uh, negative uh, sentiments now with regards to whatever that's happening in the uni now on social media. Okay. Any other questions? I'm actually at the end of the presentation. So I just want to conclude that, you know, Effective communication is the backbone of any successful operations and customer relationship. There's no successful, effective communication. Everything else breaks down. All right. So you have to embrace and practice clear, active, and empathic communication to achieve business excellence. And yes, I will always uh, highlight this adaptability. That's one very important aspect in today's world. One needs to be able to adapt to another person, so their partners or team members' differences, okay, whether it's language, whether it's culture, whether it's their work orientation, their mindset, and so on. Okay. So I've come to an end. So um, any more questions? Maybe there's one more. So how is it all right? Any questions anymore? Uh, I think it's no more again, Miss. All right. So we can we end the the presentation or how? All right. So let's end. Uh, I would like to say thank you for listening to me for almost an hour. So I hope you all learned something. 
And I learned from y'all, actually. So I really like the word cloud earlier on. So I'd like to thank for all of all of you who responded. You know, coming up with things like adaptability, timing, you know, uh, repeated questions, practice and feedback. Uh, these are the, some of the things that I also covered in my presentation. So well done uh, to all of you who participated. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Chairman, I will pass the chair back to you. Okay, thank you so much for Dr. Sarmini. Before I close this event for our participant, please open your camera. I will take a picture on the count of three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, another one, one, two, three. Smile. Thank you. Thank you for your keen cooperation. Finally, we come to the uh, visiting lecture today. We would like to thank you for Dr. Sarmini for the wonderful information and sharing your knowledge. We hope this information will be beneficial for all participants. At least we hope to have more collaboration in the future with University Malaysia Police. The visiting lecture for today and here we will see you soon. Thank you and if nice day. Thank you so much for Dr. Sarmini. Bye bye. Thank you very much as well. See you. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for having me. Bye. Waalaikum salam. Goodbye. Take care, right? See you soon. Yeah, see you Bye. soon. Bye. 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 Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Novija. <laughs>